With what's happening in the Middle East with Hamas and Israel, the prophetic clock is moving forward. Do you know that in the book of Acts, it talks about Gaza and there's something we learn? Do you know that David faced a similar situation where there were hostages taken? What did he do? Stay with me and I'll tell you. Things are very tense in the Middle East. We, we realize we're on the brink of what could be an apocalyptic situation. And so we've got to really say, God, what are we supposed to do right now? Well, first of all, let me tell you this. We're watchmen on the wall. We're called to be sons of Issachar. They understood the times. They knew what to do. But right now, you have a golden opportunity, and I have it as well, because God wants us in this hour, I believe, to apply what he's telling us in Colossians 4, 5, and 6. It says, be wise in relating to unbelievers or outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so you may know how you ought to answer everyone. How to answer everyone? Well, we're called to interact with all people, but also there's a special opportunity today, I believe that we have, and I mean this sincerely, in reaching out to Jewish people and Muslims. You know, a number of years ago, my wife and I reached out to a Muslim couple. And what did we do? We had them over, we fed them, and then we had uh, some time with them and interacting with them. Well, eventually we were able to share not only the gospel, but lead them to Christ and be present for their baptism. It was a phenomenal experience. Also in our area, there's a fast food restaurant and I, I'd go there regularly and uh, there was a man that was the general manager uh, of this restaurant. He was, he was a Muslim. Well, I would meet with him and I would give him tips on business because he had a lot of issues and problems and, you know, rotating staff and revolving door. And I gave him a book. It was, it was a book by C.S. Lewis, and I was able to share with him about the Christian faith. Do you know he got very sick about a year ago, and I went to visit him in the Vanderbilt Hospital. And even though he was in a kind of semi-conscious state, I was able to pray a prayer with him, and I asked him, could he respond in some way? Because I know the last sense that goes is the auditory hearing. Well, do you know that after he died, and I went, to the, I went to the mosque where they had this ceremony just to reach out to his family. I gave out my testimony tracts. But the lady that worked in the restaurant, his top person, she said he gave me a text and basically sent it to me. This was before his death. And in there, he referred to Jesus. And he said, saving the world. I don't know. I really, to this day, all I can say is we did our best. And now I've left it in the hands of God. Well, do you know in the book of Acts, Philip that's my middle name. He was an evangelist. And do you know what? An angel directly visited him and told him, go to Gaza. That's the spot that's in the, the, the you know, the spotlights today. Two million people, poor you know, Palestinians. But that's where Hamas took over. And they, they have their headquarters there. And this is where their base of operations is. Do you know that God loves Palestinians? He loves Jews, Muslims, and all people. Jesus died for all. And the interesting thing is, on the way to Gaza, the angel directed him. What happened? Philip met an Ethiopian guy. He shared with him the gospel. It was a divine appointment. He led him to Christ. Then he baptized him. And guess what? He continued his journey. He was an evangelizer. And that's what we're called to be today. He took advantage of the moment. Now, do you know when people say, well, I don't know what Israel should do, and, you know, we don't want to have any revenge, and we, you know, you have the Pope and celebrities saying, sign a, a you know, a ceasefire and all that. Folks, you got to remember that Hamas has a commitment in their charter. Kill all the Jews and wipe Israel off the map. That's the same thing that Iran says, and they're the ones that train these Hamas. Wall Street Journal stated that very clearly. But you can see when people say, what are we supposed to do then? Well, there is such a thing as a just war. Israel did not provoke this, but there are hostages there. And if you look in 1 Samuel 30, you'll see an occasion where David was at Ziklag. And you know what happened? They were attacked by the Amalekites. And the Amalekites came in. And what did they do? In a sneaky time, just like Hamas did, they took all the wives and the children, they plundered the area, and they split. Well, David was forced to really seek God with his men. They wept 
Their wives, their children were gone. But you know what? God didn't say, well, call a ceasefire, nothing you can do. No, God directed them and they went right in. Man, I'll tell you, they fought for over 24 hours. They defeated the enemy and even the young men fled on camels. But they regained everything. They recovered the hostages, the wives, all their children, the plunder, and they gave glory to God. Well, I believe God has divine intervention today if we continue to pray and seek his face and pray for Israel and the leaders because this is where we have not revenge, but we have what you know is it's retribution, divine justice. And Hamas is just like the Nazis. They've got to be exterminated. It's like if you went into your house and there were roaches all over the place, infestation. You'd say, what do I do? you got to get rid of them. And this whole idea, we have Mr. Joe Biden saying, well, you know, we should have the two-state solution. It's never going to happen when you have the opponents saying we have to kill every Jew. It won't happen. But the gospel can transform lives. Now, we've got opportunities. Number one with Jews, talk to them and build relationships with them uh, and do whatever you can and let them know I stand with you. And that is a way then you've got a bridge to share the gospel. Yeshua HaMashiach, talk to them about the Messiah. Okay, now the other one is what about with Muslims? Do you understand Islam? Well, let me tell you this. I've done two commentaries recently on the fundamentals of, Is of Israel. And uh, I, I gave the four. Well, do you know there's fundamentals for Islam? Islam, first of all, means submission. And it speaks of you need to submit to Allah, to God. And they have five fundamentals. They call them five pillars. What are they? This is the way you earn some place in the afterlife. It's all by works. See, they don't believe in Jesus as divine. They don't believe in the atonement. They don't believe in the Bible fully as the word of God. Uh, they, they do believe Jesus is going to come back to judge, but they don't believe that he died on a cross. The man I would talk to that was a Muslim, he'd say, well, God wouldn't punish his son. Allah wouldn't do that. And I had to explain to him the atonement. They don't believe in the Trinity either. So you've got to be wise, but you've got to understand. They're trying to earn their salvation. They've got five fundamentals. What are they? Number one, you have to swear allegiance to uh, some being called Allah and acknowledge Muhammad is his prophet. Okay, isn't that interesting? You know, the Bible talks about humility, but they made sure Muhammad got it in there that he would be the prophet. You know, no one, Moses and David, John, they're all prophets. Jesus is a great prophet, but Muhammad is the prophet. That's the first pillar. Then there's another pillar. Five times a day, they pray. And they are very pious about this, and they're required. This is a pillar in order to go in the afterlife. And then they will have a time yearly, Ramadan, you know what it is. And for the 30-day period, they fast. And they're not supposed to eat anything or even drink water during daylight hours. And this is, a, you know, a requirement. It, it is a pillar. And then there's a requirement that they give alms, uh, you, you make sacrifice, whether it's money or time or service. And that's a good thing, but it's not a good thing if it's a way that you're trying to earn your salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. Jesus did it all. And when we repent and put our faith and trust in him as the risen son of the living God, we'll experience eternal life and abundant life. You say, isn't there a fifth pillar? Yeah, go to Mecca. That's in Saudi Arabia. That's supposedly the holiest place, most sacred on earth. That's where Muhammad was born. And, and, you know, when you bury people in the Muslim faith, you're supposed to, you know, bury them so that they're facing that way. Now, all of these are just some fundamentals. But I believe this is an hour where God wants us to engage with people about the Middle East, about end time prophecy, and especially reach out in love to Muslims and to Jewish people. And let's believe God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Don't be ashamed. And this is our opportunity to reach people, to engage them effectively. Watch this on the Bullseye video. When it comes to the topic of Islam, many have communicated misinformation when they should have told the truth. You know, during his time in office, Barack Obama did us a great disservice by distorting Islam's role in America's history, as well as by disseminating falsehoods on this political ideology, this religious system. 
He said many achievements and contributions of Muslim Americans to building the very fabric of our nation, you know, strengthening the core of our democracy. Excuse me? The impression created was one of Muslims being instrumental in establishing the U.S. of America right from its inception. The narrative highlights their supposed accomplishments and contributions in making our great nation what it is today. It sounds sentimental and politically correct, but it wasn't true. At the outset, let me say as a true Christian, I love every person, no matter you know what, and I'm passionate about sharing the gospel with everyone. A wonderful experience my wife and I shared a while ago was opening our home to a, a Muslim couple for meals and conversation and then seeing them come to Christ and be baptized weeks later. It's critical to believe there are moderate Muslims who are, you know, they're reachable as we engage them with the love and truth of mankind's only Lord and Savior, Jesus. It's also important to recognize that it's not a minuscule minority of Muslims who support jihad and global domination. Pew Research revealed 22% of the Muslim population are in this camp, more than the entire population of the U.S. Islamic ideology is frightening and forthright in its core tenets. Now remember Barack Hussein Obama was shaped by Islam. His dad was a Muslim. He was given a Muslim name. His mother, you know, remarried another Muslim and he was educated in Indonesia by Muslims. Now, you know, just the facts, ma'am, you ever hear that? Sergeant Joe Friday was on a classic police drama called Dragnet and he would always say that, just the facts. Here's some. No Muslims were signers of the Declaration of Independence. The Koran had no place or even mention in the founding of the U.S. The constitutions of all the original 13 colonies acknowledged Jesus and mandated scriptural education in public schools. There's no mention of Muhammad or Allah or the Muslim faith. Beginning at the establishing of our nation in 1620 by the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock and scanning 250 years, can you even find a handful of prominent Muslim in, you know, inventors or you know, any achievements of significance? But you will find thousands of innovations, achievements, and inventions from Christian patriots of our country. During the early decades of America's founding, our leaders faced four decades of Muslim terrorism. Muslims kidnapped American sailors. They looted American ships and captured Americans to sell them as slaves. The Heritage Foundation states, quote, during America's founding, it was dragged into the affairs of the Islamic world by an escalating series of unprovoked attacks on America by Muslim pirates, the terrorists of the era. Finally, in 1804, Thomas Jefferson, our president, ordered the U.S. Navy and Marines into Tripoli to stop the terrorism of Islamists. To this day, the U.S. Marine anthem begins, you know this, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli? Well, the very nickname for Marines as Leathernecks came from the leather neck piece that was part of their uniform to protect them from beheadings. Does that sound familiar? I close with this. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on other religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's Patrick Henry, American Patriot. Hey friends, if you felt this video was helpful, make sure you like and subscribe so you get notified once new videos become available. Thanks.